then we will begin. Right, so thanks for attending today. So my name's uh, Dr. Alexander Austin. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the person who runs the B programme at Council. I've probably met many of you when dropping hives off, but there will be some of you that I've missed. So uh, if you've not seen me before, here I am. Uh, if you can put a, a face to a name. Um, and what I want to talk to today about is just a little sort of introduction really into having a hive because it's something that's new um, and you can get to grips with the, a few little bits about how to look after them, but also just a few of the obligations of being on the programme as well. Um, so we'll get going. So what does it mean to be part of the programme? That's the first thing we'll look at. Um, and then we'll look at uh, where the hive is placed. So when we came to your prophecy, we placed it quite specifically. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that's important uh, and um, why it's, you've got to be really careful with, uh, with messing around with where it currently is. Um, also, how to know that your hive's doing okay. Because one of the biggest worries that a lot of new people get um, is that they don't know if the bees are okay and something happens and they're not sure. So we'll go over a few, a few sort of key signs of how to um, how to know they're okay. Uh, and then that will hopefully give you the confidence to know, know they're okay, or if not, you can get in touch with me. Um, we'll also look at a few sort of additions to the hives that you've got now, and a couple of the perishables. So we'll look at things like roofs, and a lot of the hives that you've got will have tape on them, and we'll talk about whether that needs to be on there all the time, or, or whether you need to replace it, and things like that. Um, and then the last section will just be some, I'm going to go over some common FAQs that a lot of people have. Um, and so I'll go through those and that may actually answer uh, many of the questions you already have. And then anything that I haven't covered or um, if there's any questions you want to ask, we'll do those at the end um, and I'll do as many, I'll do all of the ones that you, that, that you want to ask. Okay. So what's the benefits, I suppose, of being part of the programme to start with? Um, I think it's a fantastic programme and uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all going to really enjoy being a part of it. Um, I mean, one of the best things is you get to have a hive for nothing, really. So, you know, you get to look after a hive free of charge and you also get access to me in terms of uh, troubleshooting and all that type of thing. So that's a really great benefit. Um, also, you can keep it indefinitely whilst you live in current guy. So it's not like you've only got it for a couple of years or something like that. As long as you look after it um, and you engage with us, the hive can essentially stay at your property for as long as you live there. So, for example, we've got some residents who have had a hive for 15 years, and there's no reason why that can't be the case with any of you as well. Um, you constantly get support from me in terms of you can get in touch with me, whether it's by phone or email, to ask any questions you might have. But I'll also send out periodic stuff as well. So if we're having really hot days or there's something that I think you should be aware of, um, I'll send a bulletin out to everybody. So you'll get a little bit of an update as time goes on when things are happening. Um, and on the enjoyment side of things, it's great for your garden. I mean, if, any, if some of you might, be think, might want, have wanted one just because you want to support the bees, and that's a brilliant reason to do it. But many of you also might be interested in trying to increase the pollination in your garden, um, and they'll certainly do that. So you'll get a benefit, and hopefully you should see a benefit, uh, especially a lot of residents who have got certain um, plants, things like citrus plants or passion fruits, for example. Um, these girls really like those, so you might see quite a significant increase in, um, in, in the fruit, hopefully, if you've got one of these now. Um, and to top it all off, you get to keep stingless bees and they're brilliant. So I'm sure within a few months, maybe even already, you'll find how charismatic they are and you get really connected to them. Um, and I think they're a lovely thing to, to have uh, in the home. So after that, I want to talk about what the obligations of the program are. So there's a few things that you have to abide by. Um, as part of the program. It's nothing drastic. It just means that um, we get to keep the program going um, and we also make sure that everything's up to date. So it's important to know that the hives does still technically belong to council. So although you can keep it all the time, um, it is something that belongs to us. So it just means, you know, look after it as, as if you were looking after it for somebody else, essentially. Um, the other obligation is that we need to be able to access your hive um, every couple of years. Uh, it may increase to sort of every three years as the program grows, but mainly it's every two years. The reason for that is the whole, the whole uh, reason you got your hive in the first place 
was that one of the other residents who already had one was kind enough to let us come around and reproduce from that hive. And that's how you've got the hive you've got now. So in order to be part of the program and in order for the program to run, it's important that everybody chips in that little bit of a uh, little bit of help. So and I think that's nice because it means that you're giving it back as well. And you know, your your hive essentially spreads and becomes part of uh, somebody else's life as well. Um, it's also important that you look after it in terms of just observing it. So it's not just about leaving it where it is and ignoring it for the rest of the time it's there. You know, I rely heavily on on the residents, on, on yourselves to, to monitor the hive because I can't be everywhere at once. Um, and so if there is a problem or you're worried about something, anything like that, I do rely on you to get in touch with me. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. It doesn't take long. It's one of those things that when you walk past it, you have a quick look and as long as the bees are coming and going, you know, you're feeling okay. But if you are concerned about something, rather than thinking, oh, well, I'll wait, just let me know. That's, that's, that's the, the best thing to do. Another important thing is you really mustn't open the hive or, or manipulate it in any way, even if you're concerned. Um, it's, you can do a lot of damage by altering the hive itself or opening it. And in some cases, your instincts may have been right, as in there may be something wrong, but by opening the hive, you can add to that damage rather than actually make it better. Um, so if you think that needs to be done, please don't do it, just get in touch with me um, and I'll come around and have a look. Um, another point is just from logistics and keeping everyone up to date, if your email address changes or your phone number changes, or anything like that, please let us know because um, otherwise we, we we can't reach you. And if we want to talk, if we need to contact you about getting your hive split or perhaps sending a bulletin out about bad weather or something like that, you won't get it. Um, so please do make sure that you, you update us if, if that sort of stuff changes. Um, I suppose the major thing is, is, I mentioned at the beginning that you can keep your hive indefinitely. And that's true as long as you live in Kuringai. So it's a Kuringai council program. You know, it's partially funded by the residents themselves. So it's really important that if you do leave Kuringai, that the hive comes back to the council so that we can then distribute that to someone else in the council area. Um, and all you need to do is, is email me and say, Alex, I'm, I'm moving out well, you know, in, in a few months time, whatever it might be. Um, can you come and collect the beehive? And I'll come and sort it out. So you don't have to do anything really other than seal it the night before, which I'd go, which I'd go over with you if the time arose. Um, that's all you need to do. Just let, let me know about it. So I talked at the beginning a little bit about how, I'd, how we were quite specific on where we put the hive when we came, um, when we came to your property. Um, and actually it's probably the most important aspect in making sure your hive is going to do well across the year. Um, the reason that is, is we're right at the southern tip of the range for this species here in Australia. So it really doesn't go much further south than Sydney. And so that climate balance, we have to be making sure we're getting that right. So what I mean by that is they mustn't get too hot in the summer, but they mustn't get too cold in the winter. And that's sometimes a difficult balance to achieve. So as a general rule, we go for sunshine in the morning, and shade in the afternoon. And that's pretty much year round. Now, of course, it's not always possible to achieve that. And we'll have done the best we can um, at your property to make sure that we, that we can do that. Um, but for example, if, if the hive's in full sunshine in the winter, it's not really too much to worry about. Um, we don't get the high enough temperatures in the, in the winter time to, for, for heat to be a, a real issue at that time of the year. Um, but if it's in a lot of afternoon sunshine, sort of after 12 o'clock in the summertime, that can be a real problem because they can get really, really hot. Um, so we'll have done everything we can to do that, uh, to make sure that it's, it's in that place. But that's why it's important. It's important because if the bees only have a limited ability to regulate their own temperature, um, and so what we want to try and do is make that as easy for them as possible. And if we've got it too hot or too cold, then it can outstrip their ability to do it and, and the hive can die. So another couple of things are just avoiding really exposed areas that get a lot of high wind. So, I mean, if you can imagine being as small as one of your little stingless bees, you know, a stiff breeze is like a hurricane. So you don't want to have them 
having air moving really, really quickly over the entrance of the hive because it's just going to make it difficult for them to fly. Um, and again, in terms of flight, where they're located now, they're most likely got a nice clear flight path. But of course, they're going to be in a garden and plants grow and things like that. So just make sure over the year that nothing's encroaching too much on the entrance so that it's blocking them. Um, it won't harm them necessarily, but it just makes their life more difficult because they have to try and negotiate all the different plants and leaves to get in their hive. So it's much nicer if you make it nice and clear and direct for them. Um, so that's the best thing to do. So I put these couple of pictures on here um, and most of you will have a hive similar to this, uh, just to give an example of, of what I mean by putting it somewhere. So you can see in most of these pictures, they're lifted off the ground, which is good, it keeps them off the soil. Um, it also makes it easier for you to see and enjoy them. Um, but they're out of the way of a heavy traffic areas. So there's not gonna be too much wind, there's not gonna be too many people walking by all the time, um, but they're not uh, in full sunshine. They've got some vegetation around them to give them a bit of protection. So, how do you know that your hive is healthy and that it's ticking along okay? The easiest way and the, really the, the most direct way that you can know is about activity. So activity levels is the key indicator um, for these bees in terms of that they're doing well and that they're, that they're healthy. So on a warm, sunny day, anything above 20 degrees, you should be seeing somewhere between 30 and 60 bees coming or going a minute. So that should give you a rough idea. And Essentially, you don't necessarily need to sit there and count um, because you'll know if there's that many coming because there'll just be you know, loads of them coming out the entrance and coming back in. So that's the sort of activity levels you want to look for. So when I mentioned earlier about um, you know, being obliged to look after the hive, really all that means is when you go out into the garden and you're doing whatever you're going to be doing, as you walk by the beehive, just have a quick stop and look inside the entrance on that sunny day and you'll see them coming and going and you can be like, yeah, brilliant, that's great, they're doing okay. So it gets a little bit more difficult if the temperature is below 20 degrees. So winter time, for example, can be a little bit difficult to know whether they're okay. Um, however, even when it's cold, you should still be able to see bees clustered at the entrance. So that picture there you can see with the little tube and all the bees around the entrance there. Some of you might have a tube at the front, some of you might not, it doesn't really matter. But where that entrance hole is, if it's a cooler day, you should be able to look down on that and just see their little heads either just inside the, the hole or a little bit further back in. And then you know, okay, yeah, they're there. And what they're doing is they're just guarding the entrance and they're waiting for the temperature to be warm enough to come out. So in the winter time, essentially they're only going to have a they're going to have a much narrower activity range in terms of the window of the day. So even on a relatively warm winter's day, you might not see them until after 10 in the morning and they're probably going to go in early afternoon because even if the day's warm, if the nighttime temperatures have dropped, it'll take them a little bit longer um, to, get up to, to get up to temperature again. Um, now, if you can't see them at the entrance, um, maybe because it's just it's particularly shady or you just can't, you're not sure whether you're seeing them, the other thing you can do is you can just pop your ear right up against the entrance tube or the entrance hole, and you should be able to hear them buzzing inside. So in that cooler weather, they gather around the brood in the middle of the hive and they buzz to keep it nice and warm. So if you're hearing that, it means they're in there and they're active. If time goes on and you're getting warmer weather or sunny days and you're still not seeing them, you can hear them, but you're still not seeing them. It's probably worth just popping me an email um, just because it means they're still there, but maybe they're, maybe they're struggling a little bit. and Maybe we might need to give them a bit of support. That's something that I can work with you with if we need to do that. So the reason I mention activity as the key indicator is because whenever there's something wrong, whether it be a pest infection or um, a fungal infection maybe, or they, they've lost a queen, um, then there's normally a knock-on effect on activity. So you'll start to see activ activity levels drop. Um, and if, if those levels start to drop below what is your normal, then that's, to be con that's, that's of concern. And it often happens quite early on in the process, as in early on in the, with, with the problem. Um, so for example, you'll, know, you'll get to know what your normal is for your hive. So there are 
quieter hives and there are really, really busy hives. And that's just the way they are. They, they have personalities, each hive. So you might know that your normal is, so you know, 30 bees a minute and your neighbours might be 60 and that's fine. But if it starts to drop below what you know to be regular, um, then it's worth getting in touch. That goes for behaviour as well. If you'll get to know what they do normally because you spend a lot more time with them, your individual hive, than I would. If you see something that they've not done before or perhaps you think it's a bit strange and they don't normally behave that way, then again, get in touch. Nine times out of 10, it'll be fine. But I'd much rather people do that uh, and we catch that one in 10 when it does happen um, rather than wait too long and it becomes too late. There are a couple of other indicators as well. Um, one of the major ones for pest infestations can be a bad smell. So if you, if you feel that the hive's getting a bit quiet uh, and, it, and it's, it's not as active as it normally is, then you can get down and have a little bit of a sniff of the entrance. A healthy hive smells resinous. It smells like eucalyptus or it smells maybe slightly sweet, but only just. Um, whereas if there's something wrong in there, it starts to smell a bit acrid. It starts to smell as if um, it's fermenting. So then if you're starting to get that bad smell, definitely get in touch with me and I'll come out and have a look. And we'll have a look at a few of the major pests in a minute as well. So you can get an idea of what they look like. So if you see them around, you can be a little bit more alert to it. So essentially, just have a look, quick look at your hive every day or every other day. You know, it's, it's, not, it's only going to take a handful of seconds. Um, and if a, if a lot of you spend a lot of time in the garden, then it's, it's easy anyway. And that way, if something does start to change or begin, a, begin to become unusual, then A, you'll have a really good idea of when it started to go a bit strange, and B, you'll pick it up really nice and early. And again, as it says at the bottom there, if you've got any concerns at all, there's no such thing as a stupid question, nothing like that. I'd much rather you email me and say, Alex, this is happening. I'm not sure what it means. Is it OK? Um, and again, I can say, yeah, fine. It's absolutely nothing to worry about. And nine times out of 10, it won't be. But if I can catch something that's wrong early, I've got a much better chance of intervening and, and, and fixing the problem. So we mentioned the pests. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail about their ecology and that type of thing, um, because it's just, a, it's just a lot of information to take in. I don't want you to worry about it right now. What I do want you to know is just roughly what they look like because there'll be lots of other insects that hang around the garden and there'll be lots of other insects that might pay a little bit of attention to your hive every now and then. But a lot of them are fine. They're nothing to worry about. These three, however, are something to be concerned about. So the large black and yellow fly there, um, the cifid fly, uh, is quite large. It's nearly two centimetres long. Um, and when you see it, you might think it's a wasp to start with, but it's a, it's a mimic. It's pretending to be a wasp. Um, they're not hard to spot because they're so big um, and they do tend to be, um, all of these pests tend to be prevalent in hotter, humid conditions. So we are coming towards the tail end of the pest season now, um, but it's still something to be worth looking at and they are still around. What they do is they lay their eggs on the outside of the hive and their maggots hatch and they attempt to burrow their way in, um, at which point they can do a lot of damage. All of these pests can be defended against by the bees, um, but it's not 100% successful. The middle little fly there, the forward fly, is at the other end of the scale in terms of size. So it's only tiny. It's probably barely half the size of one of the adult bees. It's got a very distinct hunched back. Um, and you'll know if you've got something like this because they, they don't fly into the hive. They land on it and they scuttle around it really quickly in a really zigzaggy, jerky pattern. Um, what these flies try and do is they try and crawl in the hive itself and they lay their, hive, their eggs inside the hive rather than on the outside. They can be a real problem, um, but they tend to come in uh, peaks and troughs. So we actually had quite a big problem with them this year. There was quite a lot of them. Uh, last year, well, I didn't see one at all. Uh, so again, the bees are able to defend themselves against it. They actually struggle a little bit more against this one than the other two. Um, just because the fly is so quick and it's able to evade the guards at the entrance. But I've had a, quite a few hives that have be, had these flies present and so they've sort of been under attack by them, but they fought them off and recovered. 
So it's not a death sentence. It's just something to be aware of. So if you see like one, don't worry too much. Um, make a note of it. If you know you've seen it, keep your eyes peeled. If the number of those adult flies starts to increase and you're starting to see a lot more of them, then get in touch because that might mean that they're starting to succeed and they're starting to get through the defenses. Now, the last one's a beetle and of all the pests, it's the only one that's not native to Australia. This, this came to Australia with the, um, with the Western honeybee. Uh, so small hive beetle is primarily a honeybee pest, uh, but it's quite successfully transferred to stingless bees as well. Um, much like the middle fly there, the forward fly, the beetle tries to get inside the hive and lay their eggs inside it. And it's the larva that hatch out and do the damage. Um, now, I've not seen too many of these this year. I've had a few, um, but so far, touch wood, that it's been reasonably low numbers. They're quite easy to spot. So they can range between the size of an adult stingless bee to about half again as big. So they've got a little bit of size range, um, but you can see their antennae there. They've got those sort of club-like sort of maraca style um, antennae, and that's a good giveaway um, for them. So if you spot those, if you spot one, just squish it for a start, because you don't need to let it get away. Um, but again, just like some of the other pests, be aware that they're there. Um, and if the numbers, if you only see one and then you don't see it again, Perhaps don't worry too much, just keep an eye on the hive and make sure activity is still going well. Um, if you're starting to see more of them crop up, then again, get in touch, it's something to be concerned about. What's really cool about this, the, the bees relationship with this pest, however, is that they are by no means defenseless. So um, what they do in the case of the beetle is as the beetle is trying to crawl through the entrance, the guards stick resin to the outside of the beetle until it essentially can't move and it becomes frozen in resin. And you'll sometimes find adults of these beetles thrown out the front of the hive or sort of glued up with resin. Or they will sometimes glue the beetles to the inside of the hive so they just become part of the architecture. Um, a gruesome way to go, but, but I think a fantastic defense mechanism. So they might be stingless, but they're, they're, not, they're not defenseless. Right, so I just want to talk a little bit about temperature. So this kind of follows on a little bit from um, where to put your hive. Uh, because that is linked to temperature. But I want you to be able to give you a bit of info of what you can do if it's too hot or it's too cold. So if we are getting temperatures sort of above 38 degrees, um, then that's really quite hot. And of course, anything that goes above 40 and beyond is very, very hot. Um, if a hive's exposed to that sort of heat, especially in direct sunlight, um, it can be really dangerous for them. So there's so a few things you can do in that situation. You can add a bit of extra shade. So the, the photograph here, you can see it's an older style hive, not, not the same as yours, but the idea of having the umbrella over it to give it some protection just keeps it out of that extra sun. So your hive has been situated so that it gets morning sunshine or as much as it can. On these really high temperature days, get it in shade all day. It doesn't need any sun on it at all. The ambient temperature is more than high enough um, to, to warm that hive up. The other option you can do is, um, and this is a really good sort of relatively easy but quite high impact way of cooling them down. Um, if you take a towel, like a beach towel or something, you wet it and wring it just so that it's damp. And then you can drape that towel over the hive itself. Make sure you leave the entrance free so the bees can come and go if they want to, but drape it over the top of the hive. And you can leave the end of the towel in a bucket of water and that'll act like a wick and it'll just draw that water over the hive all day um, and evaporate. The reason you use a towel is you don't want water directly on the hive because if water gets in it, that can be a problem in itself. So by having the towel, it just makes it damp rather than wet. If we get really extreme weather and, it, and it's lasting day on day on day on day, um, then there are other options. So you, you can, if you know a hot day is coming, then you can seal the hive the night before and then you can put it somewhere cool. So maybe an air conditioned utility room or a garage or a shed, somewhere where it's cooler and you can leave them in there all day, as long as they're sealed. And then in the evening, you can put them back and hopefully we'll only have one, one or maybe two of those hot days. If it's quite a long period when you seal the hive, rather than just putting tape over the front, the best thing you can do is get some insect mesh, some fine insect mesh, and then tape that to the box because that way the bees can still get air in and out of the hive, but they can't escape. So if, you're gonna, if it's gonna be in there for more than 24 hours, then that's what you wanna be doing. 
Now, cold, I put here that cold isn't as much of a problem. Um, and that's not to imply that it can't be an issue because it definitely can. It's just that extreme heat can kill very quickly. Um, and so it's the, it's the thing that we often face the biggest challenge with. Cold's a little bit longer, uh, a little bit more insidious. So this normally happens if a hive is in a heavily shaded or damp area during the winter time. And it just, it just never gets warm. And so the bees aren't able to come out and forage. They, they can't maintain the temperature of the hive and eventually the brood dies and you, you lose the hive. So if you are finding that in winter time, the spot that it is is getting too cold, it's getting no sun at all, um, then there are some little things we can do about it. And we'll talk about having summer and winter positions if, if it's entirely necessary. So additions and perishables. So most all of your hives will have come as the box. OK, um, but one of the most important things that you can, well, easiest and important things you can do is stick a roof on it. And it doesn't need to be elaborate. So you can see there's a couple here. Um, there's a more elaborate one there at the bottom. But the two at the top, you know, a piece of metal sheeting and a piece of plywood. Um, basic, but they do the job. The reason for that is, A, it gives you extra shade, which is a good thing. Um, so, and you can have quite a large, you know, area of shade with that roof. But also it keeps the rain from directly being on the hive. So that way you're limiting the chances of water getting in the gaps but you're also stopping water from pooling on top of it. So, if, especially in the winter time. So if water pools on top of it in the winter, of course, that, that can keep the hive pretty cold. Um, so it's good to not have that water standing on there. So it doesn't have to be elaborate. It can be simple. I've got a couple of other pictures that you can see. So you can see some people go really elaborate and make a, you know, a, a case or, or, or a stand to go around it. And that's utterly up to you. You know, if you're if you're particularly handy and you want to do that, fine, no problem at all. Um, it doesn't have to be anything. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be Fort Knox. It just has to be able to cover the hive and, and keep the keep the, the rain off and give it a bit of shade. But as you can see, it can go to the other end of the spectrum as well. So you can have quite a simple one like some of them here. Um, now, a lot of your hives will, will also have arrived with tape around the outside. Uh, the reason they have tape around the outside is that when we split the hives, uh, we essentially cut the hive in half and we put an empty box on top. Now, the gap where those two boxes come together is a, is a risk point. So it's an area where pests can get in or water can get in and then they can get themselves into the hive. So what we do is we tape around that so that the bees have got the time to do the work to plug all the gaps over the sort of next six to eight weeks after we split them. So essentially by now, a lot of the tape that you've got on there, it's done its job. So if it's starting to peel off or something like that, you can just remove it. Some people like to keep it on there just to be just to be sure, just to feel that it's you know a bit of extra protection. And again, that's absolutely fine if you want to reapply it. Um, but at this stage, the bees have done a lot of the work. So if the, if the tape's starting to fall off, it's better to remove it than leave it on with it all sort of being ragged because sometimes what the tape can actually do is trap water between it and the hive and then direct it in, inwards. So um, if you're going to put tape back on it, no problem at all. Um, but if it's all ragged and horrible, it's better to either remove it or replace it rather than just leave it there. Right, so I'm just going to go over a couple of FAQs to finish and then um, we'll hand over uh, and you can you can post some of some questions that you might have. Um, so one of the big ones is uh, my hive swarming. What do I do? Uh, basically nothing. Uh, don't do anything. There's nothing you can do. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon and um, it's it doesn't matter what you try and do. They're going to do it anyway. Most importantly, no harm's going to come to your hive and no harm's going to come to you. So it's not dangerous or anything like that. It's just a natural behavior. So the reason they do it is either when they're breeding. So if a hive reaches full strength and one of its virgin princesses is ready to go and make her own hive, that gets the attention of males from all around the region and they will flock towards that hive to wait for her to come out for a chance to mate with her. So then the swarm in that case is a swarm of males and they're all waiting for this, um, this virgin female to come out. The other reason 
is in defense of the hive against another beehive. So these, are, these bees are incredibly docile, really. They're very gentle, except towards each other. So when it comes to a stingless, the stingless bees versus each other, they're really quite aggressive. So some hives, when they reach full strength and they want to reproduce, they send out scouts to find a new place for their virgin queen to go. However, if they can't find a suitable place or they find a hive that they think is a little bit under strength, then they may decide to try and turf that hive out and take over like a coup. So that's why you might see another swarm. So what's happening there is you've got an attacking hive somewhere out, perhaps in the bushland or, or somewhere else along the street um, that's coming to your hive to oust the, the current queen. Um, and you'll see clouds and clouds and clouds of bees and there'll be lots of dead bees on the floor. Now, it's quite distressing to watch because there's, they, they can be quite a lot of dead bees and, and they, they lock uh, mandibles and fall to the floor um, and they just essentially stay in that death embrace until they both die. Um, but no matter what happens, you'll be left with a hive at the end. So if the attacking hive wins, then it usurps your hive and the new queen moves in and you're still left with bees. If your hive successfully defends itself, then it's shown that it's strong enough to do so. So either way, you're left with the strongest, um, the strongest hive. So there's no need to worry about it. It can last anywhere between a couple of days to a week, but it, it normally calms down after a week. Um, and then they'll just go back to, to doing their normal job. Right, I'm moving house. Can I take my hive? Um, if you're moving within Kuringai, so as in you're, you're going from, let's say, I don't know, maybe you live in Pimbor and you move into Taramara, no problem. You can take the hive with you. All you've got to do is get in touch with me. Let me know your new address. Let me know when you're going. Um, and I'll talk you through how to, how to transport the hive there, no problem. However, if you're leaving Kuringai, so if you've sold up and you're gonna to go to somewhere else, maybe another LGA in Sydney, or maybe you're moving away from New South Wales completely, whatever it might be, um, you do need to return it. So all you need to do is when you know that you're gonna be leaving, and it can, you know, you might not be leaving for another nine months, but there's no reason why you can't say, look, I'm gonna be leaving at the end of the year, you know, can you arrange to come and collect the hive? And I'll do that. Um, and it'll just be a case of, I'll liaise with you to seal the hive up the night before I come and collect it. I'll swing by in the morning, pick it up and take it to our nursery and it'll find its way to someone, another resident down the line. So I really need to move my hive, can I? Um, ideally, you should never move them. Um, but of course, we don't always live in an ideal world. So sometimes you've got no choice. So for example, if you are doing some land, uh, some rescaping of the, of the garden, or maybe you're having a pool put in or, or something where that's, there's gonna be a lot of building work going on, a lot of disruption, um, then you, you may very well need to move it because it's gonna be in a place where it just isn't going to, um, isn't gonna work. But most importantly, don't just pick it up and put it somewhere else in the garden. If you do that, the bees will still come and go, but they'll just fly straight back to where the hive used to be. And you'll just see a cloud of bees flying around where they used to be, and eventually they'll just die. And it doesn't necessarily kill the hive, but it severely weakens them. Um, and so you can, as a knock on effect, cause the hive to perish later on down the line. If you're going to have a lot of work doing like that, and the, you know, the garden's going to be a building site for a few months, then the best thing to do is email me and say, you know, Alex, we have some building work doing, and I'll take it on holiday. So I'll come and pick it up. It'll come and stay at the nursery with me for a few months until you, your jobs are done. And all you have to do is email me again and say, it's finished, can you bring my hive back please? Fine, no problem at all. We can certainly, we can, we can do that. I've got a number of got two or three hives currently that are on holiday. So that's not a problem at all. If it's only for, if you need to do something that's only gonna be done on that day. So like perhaps you need to get to a part of the garden or you need to do a bit of weeding and the hive's in the way and it's only gonna take a couple of hours. Then what you can do is pick it up move it out of the way while you do your job, but you absolutely must put it back afterwards. So what will happen when you move in is the bees will come and go and they'll fly around the old spot because they're lost. They don't know where the hive's gone. But as soon as you put the hive back there, they'll go straight back in. So all you've cost them is a few hours of foraging time, which is not a big deal, but it is imperative that you put it back if you, if you move it on the same day. Um, now, what if your current site is not good enough? 
Um, so you might find that in the winter it's too shady, for example, or the summer it's too, it's too, um, it's too sunny. There is room to have a winter and a summer position. Um, I'm not going to go over the details of how to achieve that right now because it's, it's not that common. But if you are thinking about having that, as in, you know, you're thinking that I might need to move my hive somewhere for the winter and then move it back again for the summer, get in touch with me directly and I'll talk you through how you can do it. Uh, right, so I think my hive's dead. Can I get a new one? Um, everybody is entitled to a single replacement hive um, as long as it's not due to neglect and mistreatment. And I'll know because I, I do all the post-mortems. So I know if it's because something's not been done right. So as long as you're looking after it and it dies because this it happens, you know, you can do everything right and sometimes it's just bad luck. Um, then you get a single replacement. If that one then died, um, then what you would do is you'd have to go back into the lottery again, just because you know we, there's so many people that are interested in the program. If you've had a couple of hives already, it's time to sort of pass the baton and let someone who hasn't had it before have another one. If your hive dies within the immediate time after a split, so if we come to split your hive to produce a new one, and you know eight weeks later it flies the dust, then you'll get a replacement because that's our fault. So if it dies due to a split, and I'll know because you'll have been on the splitting schedule, and so I'll know when it was done, and I'll get there and I'll take it back and I'll have a look and I'll know that that's happened, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, then you will get a replacement hive. Um, and that, that will happen as many times as it needs to. We don't lose many um, due to the splits. We've got a really good, it's normally well over 90%, um, but it can happen. So if that does happen, we'll be replaced. Right, so that's the major FAQs and a little bit of an intro um, to what, uh, what we've done. So if there have been any questions, um, I'm just gonna open up the mic for James um, and he'll be able to field them to me. Uh, and I'll, I'll ask them for you. Nothing so far. No questions. Okay. Well, if there's if there aren't any questions, or if 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 perhaps you you wanted to ask a question but you you struggled a bit with with getting it where you want it to be, um, that's no problem. All you've got to do is you can just email that question to me directly, and I'll answer it for you. Um, so, thank you for attending today, uh, and I hope that's just given you a, a nice intro. Um, to what you need to do uh, and again just to reiterate if you've ever got any problems or concerns or anything like that please do get in touch um, and, uh, and I'll sort it out so uh, enjoy the rest of your day uh, and I'm sure I'll see you soon at some point um, but uh, please enjoy your bees <laughs>